Thank you for everyone joining this super salon with Kevin Kelly. Uh, we're orienting this around the theme of Kevin's recent book, uh, The Art of Living, and um, which he called The Excellent Advice for Living. And uh, you can check that out uh, where all books are sold. Um, I actually got the privilege of interviewing Kevin several months back about his book, um, so I'm sort of co-hosting this and going to let Ashley Zhang take the lead in uh, facilitating this session. Um, generally, we wanted to orient it around how do we build a life of ideas on the internet? How do we find the others uh, through virtual communities like this? Um, talk about technology, AI, wherever things can take, take us. I think uh, Kevin is definitely a living embodiment of a lot of the lives uh, we aspire towards and are trying to prototype practice and uh, practice in our lives and uh, excited to have him here. So welcome, Kevin. Um, I'll let Ashley uh, briefly introduce you and uh, appreciate you being here. My pleasure so much. I'm so excited to see all you folks, but thank you for having me. Lovely. And thank you, Paul. Um, it's really, yeah, as he said, such an honor and a pleasure. Um, and I'm so excited to see so many like new and familiar faces. Um, Kevin Kelly, I'm sure if you're here, um, know him in, to some degree, but he is a true jack of all trades. And I think um, spiritually interintellect before interintellect was born. Um, currently, he's senior maverick at Wired, which is an amazing um, award-winning uh, winning magazine he co-founded in 1993 on technology and um, our relation to it. He's also co-chair of the Long Now Foundation, which fosters long-term thinking. Um, he's founded many um, cool websites, and he's written multiple best-selling books about the future of technology. Um, and before his work as a technologist, he was a nomadic photojournalist in Asia. So he's led a very beautiful and eclectic life, and he's a self-proclaimed radical optimist in a time, I think, sorely in need of optimistic and beautiful and humane visions for the future. So um, yeah, I think uh, we're going to structure this. We have a few um, framing um, questions for the first maybe 20-ish minutes, and then we'd love to open it up to everyone here. Um, so if you have any questions throughout this conversation, please just type it into the chat. And then uh, um, around like 9.30, we'll just start going down the list and having it uh, be more of an open, open conversation. Um, so Anna, I don't know if you have any words to add. I'm good. I'm just here as an attendee, and this is a dream come true. Kevin, welcome to Interintellect. This is your this is your home. This is the home that you didn't know you had. That's right. This this is my tribe for sure. And, and again, I'm really delighted to be here and um, looking forward to this conversation wherever it may go. Just given the intelligence of everybody here, I'm sure it's going to be very interesting. So thank you. Lovely. And for context, honesty. Wonderful founder of this like community, Interintellect, and well, we can go into that <laughs> more at the end. Um, I guess I wanted to start this conversation with the very broad question of when you reflect on your life and look back at all the very things that you've done, um, what do you think is the thread that connects your many disparate pursuits? Um. <clears throat> I, I think it's a very tenuous thread. Um, I tend to do things that I'm just curious about. And so I, 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 I learned early on that lesson that we all probably have learned ourselves, which is to kind of follow our curiosity, that that's sort of one of the most valuable things that we have. And I, for some reason, as a kid in high school, decided that I wasn't ever going to be rich. And so I was going to do things that were just interesting to me and follow my own curiosity. And I was kind of like signing up for the non-career, which was very radical. It was kind of part of the hippie thing in the, in, in the sixties. And so, um, and so my life has, you know, I really, I really kind of tried to follow the curiosity and more than anything else. And um, 
I, I kind of pretended that it had a that it had a billion dollars when actually it had no money at all. And the idea was like I would just pretend that I could afford to do things and then figure out ways to do them, whether it's traveling or building a house or whatever it was. And so um that's have served me well, I guess. And that's the connection between the individual projects are no more than just my curiosity. Mm. And what inspired you to pursue a non-career? Was it a book, a person, just a you gut know, feeling? I'm not sure because there wasn't anybody in my life that was like that, but there was, it was the, it was, um, I read Walden or read, uh, Henry David Thoreau Walden when I was in high school. And that was, he was my hero, that kind of um, doing your own thing, building a house and kind of living life very intently. And I think, um, I think that was maybe the my um, the most influence at that time. Later on, a few years later, I saw the Whole Earth Catalog and Stuart Brand's work, and that was my permission slip. That was um, that was the moment when I actually um, decided to to really invent my life, just just sort of make it up, because I because now I had role models besides Thoreau, more modern people who were very aware of what they were doing and were, were telling me that all these things were possible, like build your own house, like travel the world, like repair your own car. These, these were all things that I had no idea were really possible. And then there were people who were doing it and they're saying, yeah, you can, you can do all these things. And it's like, oh my gosh, this is the golden ticket. And you mentioned Stuart Brand, who I know um, was a great mentor and friend to you and still is. Um, I was wondering how you find peers and mentors as you're carving your own path, um, because there aren't really obvious bubbles, except perhaps like interintellect, where you can find similarly oriented, um, like weirdos who yeah. are in the process of self-authorship. <clears throat> For some reason, a lot of my mentors existed in between pages of a book. Um, I, I was a big believer in reading um, and what you could learn from books. And you can't really tell, but I'm in a two-story library I'm surrounded by books. And um, and so that was, most of my mentors were sort of in, in books themselves. And um, until I met, you know, I met Stuart and he was a real person and he had friends and then working with them. And that was... I guess, yeah, I I, de I deliberately went to the Whole Earth Catalog to work there. And so um, it took me a long time to actually be hired because in the beginning, I didn't have anything to offer. I, I, I didn't, it wasn't valuable to them. And um, it took me a while to have something to offer. But then when I did, I, it was a good fit. And so... Um, that's a piece of advice that I now talk about for my kids, which is um, you want you, it's really hard to kind of know what you're really good at when you're young. And it's really hard to kind of decide. Um, sometimes people don't even have a passion in the beginning, but I, I counsel that you should, you should become master of something. You, you should become expert at something that doesn't really matter what it is to something that you're better at than most people or maybe even better than anybody. And that thing may not be the thing you want to do all your life, but it will become a platform. It will become a bridge. It will become a way in which you can then find that, that thing. And so that's what I needed at whole earth was to become expert on something. And what I became expert at was budget travel. All right. And it was like, um, you know, I, I just traveled so much and I became so, so informed about places in the world that people weren't going to that I was involved with Rick Steves, Lonely Planet, and all those people in the early days of, of budget travel. Um, and I knew a lot. And that was my entry into Whole Earth was I was then expert on traveling in uh, low cost in Asia. And so I didn't want to stay there, but that's sort of where... That was the entry. So, so 
you need to become master of something as a way of kind of finding what you're really, what's really, um, what you're the best in. And how do you determine uh, what is worthy of your efforts and your mastery or attempt at mastery? Um, and also like say, of course there will be challenges in the way, but um, when do you know when it's time to give up or pivot or yeah. reinvent? Man, it would be great if there was a formula for that, but there's, but there's not. Um, that's the art. Um, I I say, um, yeah, you you sort of, you want to have the determination to never give up. You want to have the wisdom to give up when it's necessary. And you want to have friends to help you decide between the two. I think it actually takes other people to help you make that decision of when you pivot, when you surrender and move on. I think it's really hard to do it only by yourself. You need kind of outside data. Um, and so, um, it, it is that, that kind of, and, and it's interesting to me that I, I, my view of the human character is that it's, um, that your virtues and vices, your strengths and weaknesses are actually, actually the same dimension, just opposite poles. So like the difference between, uh, persistence and stubbornness is very thin. The difference between generosity and foolishness is pretty thin. And so I think the difference between the positive and negative version of those kinds of things is um, your ego to the extent that you're doing it in an ego way or in a, in a, in a, in, in a selfless way. So if you're, if you're persistent, if you're persistent and if you never give up on things that matter, that's persistence. If you never give up on things that don't matter, that's stubbornness. And so um so I so I, I think it's really tough to kind of um, be aware of 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 your best things by yourself. I think you we need everybody here. You need all the people around you. You need a village to actually make you unique. I don't think we can become unique by ourselves. It's kind of a paradox. It's weird that you can't become a unique individual all by yourself. You actually require everyone around you to help you become unique, and so, um, and so I'm really, I, I think that's part of this process of like when you surrender, when you give up. I think you need, you need other people's views of you and what you're doing to help you come to those kind of decisions. And um, you've written about. Um, like, I guess you've been a prophet of some sort, like networks of like digital communities and cultivating friendships on um, the internet before this was really a thing. Um, mm -hmm. So how do, you, how do you think digital communities can think about cultivating trust and intimacy? Um, I feel like there's still this like huge um, gap to be bridged um, between like in-person uh, friendships and also just like meeting people who you could really click with on a much deeper level. Yeah, I, I I think I think you're right. I think this is kind of a frontier in a certain way because I mean, communities are not new to humans. We we've, we've been involved in a long time, but they were most of the time. I had a friend, uh, John Barlow, who used to define um, real communities as one that you didn't have a choice about that you couldn't that you couldn't leave, and that was what growing up in you know in his little town in Wyoming was was like you know there was. You could kind of leave, but you were it's like having a family. You were kind of stuck with people and you had to work it out. And um we're now trying to make communities in a very different way, different kind of environment where people have a lot of choice to come and go. And so I think it's a kind of a frontier of learning how to collaborate in different ways, in different ways than we have in the past. Like, you know, say planetarily you know, right now, just looking at the people here coming from so many different parts of the world. And then we're going to try to collaborate in real time. And there's all kinds of physical things, the time differences. We have language issues. There's so many things. And I think this is an incredible opportunity to invent new ways of collaboration and community. And I, I, I think we should, what's the word I want? I think we should honor the fact that, that we don't know. I mean, there aren't a lot of received wisdom 
about that. We know some things about, you know, um, how to maintain friendships loosely, how to work with lots of people who have different opinions. But I think we're also headed, this is kind of a new territory in terms of collaborating at scale. I mean, that was one of the things that we're now doing. I mean, the number of people here is like, this was a size of a clan in the past, um, but we can do even bigger. And so um, how do you do a million people? Can you do a community with a million people? Is that even possible? Or is it Dunbar's number that's the limit? We don't even know. We 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 can we, we can still figure things out. And I think that's the exciting thing of what you're doing is of um trying to um see the different ways, all the different ways we can arrange human connection. And some of them aren't gonna work, that's fine. Some of them might work, some of them might work halfway. And so um I, I think this this period right now where we're trying lots of different things is really very exciting. And I don't have any, I, I don't think we know the answers about how we do this. And and, and um, you probably have more knowledge about this than anybody at this point. Yeah, I think this is an interesting thing. A lot of us are in these emergent communities and I've met a lot of people in person too. Uh, and there's all these things like network state, biology's doing, there's this experiment Zuzulu Vitalik yep. was doing earlier this year. What um, you probably saw a lot of the intentional communities in the 70s and yeah. 60s. Right. Uh, what what are we missing? What mistakes are we repeating? Is this just mm. a, a cycle we go through over and over again? Yeah, I see a yeah. lot of people in my generation. Oh, let's all move together and form an intentional community. And it, you yeah, read yeah. history, and it's like this was happening <laughs> prior to the Civil War, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Americans have a lot of uh, <clears throat> from Vineland and onwards, Oneonta. Yeah. So there's 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 a whole tradition of intentional communities. Um, I mean, I they're difficult. They're difficult to to maintain. Um, and, um, I would say that, um, I'm not an expert on, on the dynamics of them. Um, I have never lived in the commune, but man, I, I, I have lots of friends who have, and I have no interest in living on a commune at this point, just given uh, what I know from, from what happens, it's, um, it's really um it's really tough but 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 the good news is that there is a, a long history there is there is um you know what there 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 is something we can learn from from the past about this so you can avoid i did for those who are interested in at whole earth it was called i think it was uh, cq at the time coevolution quarterly which is now up on publicly so we have a full scan of the whole whole earth catalogs and all the publications and they're really really great um you can read this but i did an exit interview with all the people all the guys and girls all the there were adults at that point who lived on the farm in tennessee with stephen gaskin which is one of the biggest communes where it was very successful they were really doing really interesting stuff and they were there for 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 decades, and they finally left. And they came in as teenagers, and they they were totally communist. They had no they had no individual money, and um, they finally left. And they came and they had, they started the well. They were they were the first guys on the well doing the the community building for the well. Were these people who had been living communally, and so um, that was very very important in, in kind of trying to make the new culture we were like the first real online community um we were the first public access to the internet and so um but i did an exit interview where i was interviewing them and what worked on their community and what didn't work and why they left and why they were there and if anybody was trying to make a kind of an intentional commune of that of that nature, which is was was where you um, shared money or didn't share money, or I would say you shared what little money you had. Um, they should read it because it was um, it was really really revealing. So um, I think, what do I know? Um, 
I know that the the ones uh, the the ones the ones that worked over time seem to uh, seem seem to seem to make it easy to come and go. I think the ones that were having difficulty was ones where leaving became a stigma, where you were betraying people, where you were we were in some ways um you were in some ways betraying the people who who were there and that it was the beginning of usually very very strange dynamics in it and so the ones that were a little bit more casual about people coming and going seemed to survive a little bit longer in terms of longevity but that's only one dimension about these things there could be things where you can have intentional communities and their their intent is to be there for five years and then disappear. So longevity is only one of those dimensions, but it was a very rare one. There could be other metrics that you used about whether something succeeded or not. And I think that's to me is the, the excitement is, is that you could, and this is what I tell young people is um, come up with your own definition of success. All right. That, that's what you want. And so, part of what we want with these communities is new definitions of what is successful. Right. And so longevity is one thing, but not the only thing, you know, uh, there are other ways to, to measure impact. You others, there are others way, ways to measure what people get out of them. And I think that's part of what is going on is coming up with some new definitions of success. When you were talking, I was thinking like the line between a strong community and a cult is very thin. It is. Um, but... Right, yeah. and, and if you can't leave, that, then it's a cult. Yeah, yeah. Um, I also wanted to ask, how do you currently define success for yourself, and how has that evolved over the years? <laughs> That's a good, great, fair question. Great question. Um, so, uh, two things. One, one is I'm trying to maximize my learning. It's, it's like the, 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 if if um, you know, my business is giving talks and speeches and, and, and it's really like, well, in addition to giving talks, I need to be learning something. I need to, I, I don't want to do this unless I am also learning at the same time. And like here, this is, this is a great example. I'm learning all kinds of things about what you guys are interested in and what, what's, what's happening here. Um, and so th that's a reason for me to do this. And um, so that's one thing is, is, you know, optimizing my learning. But the second thing that that more and more I I, I try and, and and read as a success is, I'm really interested in doing spending my time investing my time in the kinds of things that um, only I would do that no one else would do want to do or could do, and so a very common question that I ask myself when I have an idea about whether it's something I want to do is yeah this is really this would be really fun i would really like this i think i'd be pretty good at doing this i could probably even earn some money doing it but then the fourth question do the first three of the kind of holy trinity for most people but there's a fourth question a fourth level which is can anybody else do this would anybody else do this because if someone else could do it or would do it then i'm not going to do it because that means that I'm not the only one who could do it. I wanted to have, I want to get to the point, and 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 I've been trying that, is is where no one else is going to do it. So I'm the only one doing it. And when that is true, it's 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 a relief because suddenly there's no competition. I, I I'm not in a hurry. I can take my time. I can do it whatever way I want. I'm not in a race, and um, it's it's mine. And the one of the ways I get to that is I am a big believer in trying to give away my ideas. I when I have an idea, I start trying to give it away. I tell everybody about the idea. I tell everything I know about it. Um, I'm just I'm trying to sell it. I'm hoping someone will steal it because if they steal it, that means oh someone else could have done it. I don't have to do that. And so if I can't get anybody to steal my ideas after a couple of years, oh. I have, I can do it now. And so, um, so, so that is one of the ways I would rank success. Success for me is, and this is a bit of advice I have in the book is I, I know 
I'm not trying, I'm not aiming to be the best. I'm aiming to be the only. And I think that's a much better place to aim for. Wonderful. Uh, Paul, do you have any last questions before we open it up? Yeah, we, uh, Ashley and I were talking before the event and, um, and if you have questions for Kevin, start putting them in the chat and we'll call on you guys to ask them. And if you want to ask questions of us, the group too, Kevin. Yeah, we'll, uh, I, 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 I let, would take advantage of that for sure. Let, let you do that as well. But I was thinking about like, do you, when you're reinventing yourself, you're, you're shifting between different things throughout your life. Um, you can operate without any sort of psychological coherence of how anything fits together. Do you have periods where you embrace that uncertainty? Do you have other periods where you like, okay, I need to figure out how this all makes sense. How do you deal with like the own story you tell yourself about what you're up to? That's a good question. Um, um yeah so I'm, I'm working on a project right now and I, right now and this project i have no idea whether it could possibly even work whether it's going to be successful whether it's going to be useful um and i i'm 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 fine with that i'm 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 it doesn't it doesn't bother me i guess i could say yeah, I'm, I'm comfortable with that uncertainty and um i think there are other times when maybe for certain conditions where i'm not comfortable knowing that and i want more clarity um so i would say it kind of depends um and it varies but i but uh, I'm probably a little bit more comfortable with uncertainty than maybe most people. Um, and I'd like, 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 like when I travel or like when I travel, I will go into areas where I have literally no idea what's going to happen, where I'm going. Um, you know, I'm, I, and I like to get lost in that sense. Other people find that very, very um, uncomfortable, but I'm perfectly happy to deliberately try to get lost, meaning like I literally don't know where I am. And um, that kind of uncertainty, because I know that, because I know that I will discover something really cool for me. And so um, I maybe have had enough practice in that kind of thing. And I think maybe that's another way of saying is you can practice being comfortable with uncertainty is something you can kind of work on. And you do it enough, you kind of know that it's going to work out and and writing is a little bit like that where where you you um in the beginning it's very messy it, the first draft sucks um but you know you have enough experience to know that you're going to work through that the the guys at pixar talk about that all the time that every movie sucks and their entire job is to unsuck the movie over time right it starts off really really sucking all of them do, and they have a sucky movie. And so their their process is they know of a process which they can trust, which will unsuck the movie to to, the, to gets to the unsuckable end. And so um, I think there's a little bit of 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 that 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 you can learn to sit with not knowing fundamentally, not knowing whether this is even worth doing, and um, sometimes it isn't. But mostly you kind of work on unsucking it over time. I want to ask like one final question just because I'm curious. Have you had any like, oh, well, major regrets in your life? Yeah, <laughs> not too many. Um, not too many. Um, we have three kids and I've talked about the fact that we tried and regret that we didn't have a fourth um my unsolicited solicited advice to everybody present is to have as many kids as you possibly can because you will never regret that um so um that's one regrets uh but but no um by and large i don't have a lot of regrets um jeff bezos talks about regret minimization of kind of trying to make decisions that would minimize regrets. And 
most people there was Dan Pink did a whole book on regret. He's and 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 by and large, most people, older people, when they listed their regrets, were about not things that they did, but things that they did not do. So if you were a doer, you're more you're more likely not to have regrets. If you're someone who um doesn't do things, then so so I I I think um I think that's a good thing is is you know try to say yes as much as possible. Wonderful. Okay, I could continue to pepper Kevin with questions, but let's open it up to the group. Um, I think Paul, unless you saw, is Kevin McMurphy's the first question. I've been kind of scrolling, but I don't know, Paul, if you've been. Yeah, I think uh, Will had a couple earlier on. Will, do you want to uh, unmute and ask, and then we'll get to you, Kevin? Sure. My first question was, have you had kind of, when you were talking about kind of following your interest, following your curiosity, have mm -hmm. you had any, because right, you can't choose everything to be the skill that you really pursue mastery. And so have right. you had any memorable kind of forks in the road where you picked one or the other or any paths that got away from you? Yeah, I um, I was always interested in art and science and couldn't decide whether to go to art school or MIT and um and eventually I, I dropped out after a year because I I kind of went to the technical side and I probably should have gone to art school. I maybe I would have completed it. But um I was on I, I found photography and photography for me in the nineteen seventies, early sixties, when you had to do the chemistry yourself and all the optics, it was a very, very technical thing. And that and for, for me, the uh, photography was sort of the nice melding of art and technology and art and the technical and because it was a very technical thing so i was really trying to become a photographer and i wanted to do become a national geographic photographer and i started um down that road and when i first left my first trip i was 19 years old new to photography and i i uh I went to the telephone book and I called up National Geographic, one of their editors, and I told them I'm headed to Taiwan and in Japan. Do you need any photographs? <laughs> and they said, you know, that's not how it works here. But um, when you come back, show me your pictures. And I started doing that. The guy was just really fabulous, and I was on my way to you know become professional photographer um but what happened was i started to meet actual other national geographic photographers on the road and stuff and i saw what their lives were like and i decided that that was not what i really wanted that the, the actual life of a professional photographer was not my idea that's not what i wanted to spend my time doing and so that so I made this shift to like okay, um, I'll I'll write more or my captions were getting longer you know I'll, I'll be much more interested in actually the, the the text around the photographs, and so I, I headed much more towards towards trying to learn how to write away from just the image. Of course, when we went into Wired, that was you know my background and kind of the visuals was part of what Wired was about was this was this melding of the very visual and the writing so it was perfect for me but the point was that i um saw what an actual what, what the day-to-day -day lives of professional photographers were it was like not that appealing to me and it's always by the way shocked me from a number of people that i've met who decided they want to become a lawyer or a doctor or something and then go through the whole training and then after the first year of actually doing it they can't stand it so, and it's like did you not ever shadow a lawyer or doctor? Did you not ever intern to see what actually the day-to-day -day life is? You should really do that if you have aspiration is you know get a little taste of what that actually means to to practice rather than what you kind of imagined. And that's what happened to me was was seeing I had a, I was imagining what a professional National Geographic photographer's life was like, and it was nothing like that. Uh, Kevin and then Anna.
You're muted. Yeah. Shit on mute. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> just kind of following up on that curiosity piece. I, I'm like you just probably like everybody in this room, insatiably curious. Um, but that leads me down rabbit holes mm -hmm. that are really distracting or what a lot of the world would call really distracting, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe we're finding out something different here. <laughs> what does it look like for you to practically chase curiosity? And do does that help you with intentional decision-making, like you said, on where you want to end up? Yeah, I, I have sort of um, surrendered to the idea of wasting time. I, I think wasting time is really, really important for creativity. And um, I think that's the difference between the young and the old is the young are really good at wasting time. They'll spend, they'll spend, you know, a hundred hours playing a video game and uh, anybody old or middle ages just can't afford that. And I think that's, th that I think that's to their detriment. And so, um, so I'm, I'm a much bigger believer in goofing off, wasting time following the rabbit hole down to the bottom i don't don't see these distractions i think I, I see these distractions as valuable over the long term and um uh if it, you know like anything it could be an addiction it does prevent you from actually you know having human relationships and all this other kind of stuff then that would become a problem but i think intellectually I I don't see a big problem with it. I, I actually see a big a big benefit. And that is um you're much more unlikely to uncover something that no one else really is thinking about or cares about. And that's the only way to get there. Um it's it's those idle diversions, so to speak, that actually can become the main event later on for most people in a in a good way. Because otherwise you're just with the herd. You're just following everything else everyone else is following, and you're unlikely to be anywhere different. And so um, I actually re revel in those um, those rabbit holes. And yes, as long as you are enjoying it. I mean, if you're some weird thing where you hate yourself doing, okay, well, then you need to look at that. But if you really enjoy it, it's, in the end, I think it's going to... Um, it's going to pay off. And are you protecting time to do that? In a certain sense, in a certain sense, this, I don't know if I can say this, but it's like, I actually think like this, this is like, this is the main thing. Like you do all these other things so that you can spend an hour following some weird Wikipedia thing. That's the whole purpose. It's not like you're trying to, um, that this is sort of, again, some diversion. I, I, I'm saying that, that, that in some ways, I arrange my life so that I can follow the Wikipedia trail to somewhere. That's I am living at that moment in a certain way. I'm following my curiosity. It's not like, yeah, we can say it's wasting time, but actually... What I'm trying to say is not a waste. It's 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 another thing. It's actually the thing to be doing. So it's the inverse. You're time boxing yeah. the other things. Right. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. Anna. Kevin, let me just add. It's the one hour on Wikipedia. We all know it's more like seven. <laughs> yeah, right. I know. Like That's true. And then the sun is rising and everybody's angry at you. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, if, and for me, by the way, is YouTube. I am, I am, my YouTube is my, is my thing. So yeah, but it's the same thing. The rabbit holes. Indeed, I think I, I was a, a freshman in college when Wikipedia happened and Oh boy, that was a good timing. I'm still still grateful uh, to Jimmy uh, for for having having pulled that off. And he was uh, with us uh, recently at the salon, and we collectively thanked him for ruining our family lives uh, forever. Um, actually, my my question I think is is related to that. Um, you know, interintellect. We like to be a little bit decadent, a little bit pointless, because we think that you know the best things come from productively wasting um, wasting our time. And if it's done together, it's even better. 
Um, but you know, I'm a millennial and I noticed that in my generation, most of the people who are trying to follow your example and give other people advice, unsolicited or not, um, will kind of fall into either the productivity advice category or self-care. Um, to me, it always feels a little bit navel gazing that I think we are more attached to each other as humans than just one person to be able to solve their own productivity or their own balance of their their mm -hmm. soul. Um, how do you how do you see that generational trend? Um, is this just the surface and they are actually trying to say something else that we should be listening to? How how, how do you feel when you, you run into that onslaught of content? So um, I'm, I'm still parsing your question. So how do I feel when I encounter young people who are productivity advice, self-care advice as kind of the main areas of advice? Yeah. When it comes to um, advice giving content. I, so you're saying like curiosity is like orthogonal to those. Or or communality. Yeah. I I, I might I may not understand the question enough to answer, but um, I I don't, uh, maybe I don't know or have much contact with the young people who are giving advice that you you know. But I mean, I'm I know Tim Ferriss, right? So there's Tim Ferriss, and he's very. He began a very productivity or and has become much more touchy feely over time, um, and um, so I so I'm not maybe I'm not really sure what the um, the phenomena is that you're, I, I may not have as much experience with that. Maybe for the better, maybe, maybe we'll just, well, talk. yeah, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. Let's see. Who do we have? Um, I think Ellen asked a question and then we'll do Adam. Hello. Hi. Um, I, I would like to know uh, what have you learned from the Long Now Foundation and how has that changed your own perspective on long-term thinking? Yeah. Great question. So thank you. Um, for the benefit of those who may not know the Long Now Foundation, it was uh, established uh, 25 years, 26 years ago to encourage and promote long-time long-term thinking and what we also call long-term imagination and long-term responsibility. So anyway, the long-term perspective. And I, I think that's been very, very clarifying for me because I there were things that I had hunches about that we were able, that I was able to articulate over, over that span. We've been running a seminar series for 20 years and we invite people to give a talk about long-term thinking. It's like, we in the beginning, we said, we don't know what this is. Come tell us what long-term thinking means. And so we've had, you know, 300, 400 um, talks about people interpreting it in their way. And I think what I learned was um, one, of the, one of the ways that I have become more optimistic over time is by taking a longer view that the longer the view you take both of the past and of the future, the easier it is to be optimistic. And um, because what you understand is that civilization is sort of an accumulation of these little tiny, tiny, tiny wins, these little tiny incremental betterment that are not, not really visible in the present. A 1% betterment is not really visible, except in the past you see this accumulated over time and as going forward, if your horizon is not the next quarter, next new two years, but 10 years or 20 years, it permits you to overcome all kinds of fairly major setbacks can be overcome over the long term. And that helps me become even more optimistic than I have. So I think I would say, in short, one of the things I got from it, the change was my deliberate shift to becoming more optimistic over time. And by the way, my optimism is not just a personality, it's also a choice. And um, 
I've deliberately become more optimistic because of that long view that long now sort of illuminated. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, being interested in the Long Now Foundation, and uh, I, I donated to the uh, interval when it was starting up. And well, all thank that. you. And I've listened to some of the talks, so I think it's changed my perspective over time too. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah. So the idea is is that um, what we'd like to have is what we call generational thinking, where maybe some of the benefits or maybe even most of the benefits accrued not to the people starting the project, but later on. So you, you build a road and maybe the road is costly, but maybe the road doesn't pay for itself for 10, 15 years or to another generation. That's worth doing. And a lot of the, a lot of the things that we benefit from our own lives today were, were, were built in the past and took a while to pay off. And so you're kind of investing into the future, future generations and saying, um, uh, this is, you know, the long-term ism, which is a little different, which is that most of the people who will ever live will be born in the future. And so we sort of owe the future something. And I think there is some, I think that's true to some extent. It's not entirely, the future doesn't, shouldn't um, hijack the present, but um, we do, we think we can make a better civilization by paying more attention to the future of future generations. So p people want to hear a bit more about this optimism. So I'm sort of thinking like I, I sort of optimism pilled myself through the creative work and I left the corporate path behind, started goofing off a little more, started doing uh, writing and became a lot more optimistic in the process what are some of the on-ramps you've seen in people? Like I, I see so many people that are sort of uh, attached to their own cynicism in a yeah. way that I, I don't actually know how to give people on-ramps onto an optimistic worldview. Yeah. Well, it's tough. It's tough. And um, for me, what the first thing is is as a longer view in, of the past and of the future. So the long view of the past is that if you take a very, very fair scientific rational look at the world, you have to admit the reality of progress, let's say the last three or four hundred years. And so all the conditions that generate that 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 positive impact over time, are still at work. And so that progress is highly likely to continue. It could stop tomorrow for some weird reason, but it's very unlikely. So statistically, that progress will continue. So, so you can become more optimistic the more you study history, the more you really look at history. So that's the second thing is the longer view. And then really the most optimistic futurists I know are all really great historians. So invest into history. And then the 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 other thing that I find is um, if you understand that bad things happen fast and good things, all, all good things take time, they, they happen slowly, it means that the news of any type, the highest quality news, whatever it is, by definition is going to be bad news. Okay? So, so if you if you if your world is framed by the news, what's happened in the past week or two weeks or even the year, it's going to be hard to be optimistic because it's all going to be bad news. If we only rate headlines every 10 years, they'd be very, very optimistic, be much different. And so um, try not to be misled by news in general which by definition is going to be reporting. I can tell you that whatever happened in the last five hours is bad news, right? It's, and so if you're, if you're framing what's the, if you're framing the, around the news, it's going to be pessimistic. So you have to get out of that and look at history and look at the longer view and understand that, you know, pay attention to science. 
science is really the only new news and um um don't 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 have your view of the world framed by the news so that's i find very very useful so it doesn't mean that you have to never look at it but it means that you really don't want it to be dominant in your um, in your in your view of of what's going on. And I, I would say one last thing. A... I will, yeah, one last thing about it. And that is um, one of the reasons to be optimistic as you possibly can is that, first of all, everything in our world that you admire, that we like, was created by an optimistic person, a person who believed that that change was possible when most people did not. And so um, if we are to make really good future, if we are to make good things in the future or even a good future that we want, it's very hard to do it inadvertently. It's very hard to do that accidentally. It actually requires to have a vision of what it is. Those um, little communicators in Star Trek were incredibly influential in people making the smartphone. All right. And so um, you want to be able to see something because that it makes it much more likely that it'll happen. And that act of imagining a future that works and believing that it can be done, that's optimism. So the future is going to be, our future will be shaped by the optimists of today. And so if you want to shape the future, you need to be as optimistic as you possibly can. Beautiful. Did, did you have something to add on that, Anna? Oh yeah, thank you so much. Um, first of all, I, I, I love this. Even, even the preventative measures are built by people who at least are optimistic enough that it will work. Um, right. I just, you know, when I started Interns in 2016, October 2016, the first one year I was so kind of influenced by the headlines that you're mentioning. And this whole thing was 180 degrees the other way around. It was preventative. It was trying to solve human discourse by, you know, putting in different shields so people can shape their experience. You know, we were living in the, in the chatbot uh, panic, the Facebook panic. And everybody was burying technology with a big cross on it. Um, and then I had this little voice and I thought, what if I tried something where there's no, there are no fences. We just trust people. We create rules. We read James Carson, create an infinite game that can just happen. Um, and the more I do it, and I, I think I'm probably the person in my organization who has been to the, the, the most salons, both online and offline, the more time you spend with people, I think it's impossible not to become more optimistic. I mean, here is Paul. Paul started, you know, appearing in my in my online network before his book, before his baby, before his world trip. You know, it's it, it's impossible to observe people through your community across any span of time and not be optimistic by all the amazing things they are doing. Sure. Yeah, you're the, right. The the yeah. photos from their trips. And I think one of the best things to to you know tell people who want to be more more optimistic is just spend more time with people. Mm -hmm. Really, mm -hmm. I, particularly young people. That's another source. Is I like to hang out with my children's friends because um, you you can be in, because it gets easy to trust the future. I mean, th this is this is what I would say. Another reason to be optimistic. Is not I'm optimistic not because I believe that our problems are smaller than we thought. We have huge problems and we're going to have even bigger ones in the future. I'm optimistic because I think our capacity to solve problems is bigger than we thought. Okay? And that's what the young, the next generation is. They will be able to solve more problems than we are. So you're trusting the future. So, so yeah, so it's it's my optimism lies not in, in denying our problems, but embracing our ability to keep solving problems even better. I love that. And was, was Adam next? Yeah, I think Adam. And then uh, Tim. 
Okay. Did you cool. ask already, Adam? Go ahead. I'm sorry. Can you hear me? I can. Oh, excellent. Well, I think you and I are the only two guys in here over 65. Well, um, I don't know that for sure, but I am definitely over 65. I I am as well. So uh, I, I think I first connected with Paul when I texted him something about his book and the, the fact that I've been on a path for 40 some years and you know what, it wasn't all that bad, but one day I decided I'd get off and now I'm off. The question of course is what's next? I'm particularly enthusiastic about your enthusiasm for optimism. Um, and I think, well, one of the things I've been thinking a lot about is the, I'm mean, I froze. No, right when I got excited. Let's wait a bit and then see if he gets back on. Paul, I think you're muted. I'm still optimistic that Wi-Fi will eventually just be <laughs> seamless. <laughs> Uh, um, oh, Adam's back. <laughs> okay, oh, you're back, Adam. I'm back. Yes, have, you are back. You, I have you broke off right when you were talking about optimism. I, I have an amazingly uh, expensive high speed internet connection here, uh, and I'm not going to tell you who the provider is because obviously it's not working all that well. Um, the uh, um, optimism is is obviously. Uh, oh. Well, he's having a glitch. It's a pessimistic internet provider. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Doesn't want him to say anything. Uh, let's see who I think we had. Um, all right. Who wanted to ask a follow-up question? He said, how do you figure out if we can be the only one doing the thing you can do? That was Adam's question. Yeah, that's that's Adam is that Adam you're back now was that your question how do you figure out how you can be the only one um that was one question I, I'm going to just ask one more in case I blot out again um I'm looking for a way not to be a Kevin Kelly <laughs> but to be like a Kevin Kelly who has 40 to 50 years of stuff that I've done and in three to four times in my career I have actually been the only one doing what I was doing. Mm -hmm. I want to be able to pay that back or pay it forward or whatever definition. I, I, I don't have a need to feed my ego. I know how to get some stuff done. And I'd like to be able to be a guy who at, I just turned 71, still got some hair, haven't lost my sense of humor quite yet. And they haven't crushed the curiosity out of me. I, I'd like to, to, um, figure out a way to be more intergenerationally active. I mean, mm -hmm. my baby's 31 years old. Um, the other one's 37 and they're doing terrifically. And by the way, they're having babies, which I see as an amazing vote of confidence in the world and, and, and in America. But, but how do I figure out the best way to figure out what the best way to communicate what I've done that might be helpful to somebody else. And, you know, obviously you're doing that because you have a voice and a platform. I think there are many more of us out there who could be able to do that. Yeah. Um, let me address your, your first question was how do you figure out your onlyness? And I think, I think, first of all, it, it, it takes your lifetime. I, I, I think it's, it's not, it's not something that it's a, it's not a destination. It's it's a direction, and that I've had the privilege of hanging around with a lot of very successful billionaires, people who are billion, have billions of dollars. We would we would call most people would call them successful in some capacity, and the and the shock is that they are still asking the question of what they want to do when they grow up. Yeah, having a billion dollars does not answer that question. In fact, it complicates it. In fact, here's a bit of advice I would say to everybody here. Um, try as hard as you can to never have a billion dollars. Okay? You do not want to have a billion dollars. A couple hundred million? Okay, fine. But not a billion. It's very toxic and, and imprisoning and distorting 
and terrible for your kids. But the 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 thing is is that it doesn't answer the question of how to be the only still because they've done something. Maybe it's sometimes a lot of luck involved, and they still are trying to figure it out. And so. When you're young, you it's very rare for someone to kind of know exactly what they're really better at or, or different at or the only at. And it, and it takes a long life to kind of figure out, I'm still working on it. And it's not done. It's, it's not a destination. You're always moving in that direction. And so I think that's the best you can hope for is, are you moving in that direction? Are you moving somewhere where you have a more of a sense of what it is? And um, one of the, the ways I think you can tell, one of the signs is, are you working at a place where people don't have language for what it is that you're doing? There's no name for what it is that you're doing. I'm sure a lot of people here are working on things, or maybe full time, where there's not a good term for what it is that you're doing. There's, there's no occupation. There's no title. It takes 15 minutes for you to explain to your parents what it is that you actually do all day. That's a good sign that you're on your way to being the only because there's no label for it. And as much as you can, you want to be working in those areas where you're ahead of the language, where you're, where you're working where there's, there's no words for what it is that you actually do. So I would say that's one of the indicators that you're on the right path and that it's a path. It's not a destination. And I think the second question was around, um, I guess, sharing your wisdom with future generations. I guess you have your, your book, which I guess you can plug again. Well, Life. yeah, yeah. Oh, my book, I plug. Yes. Okay. So uh, <laughs> here's the book. It's called Excellent Advice for Living. Um there's it's very very easy to read one of my one of the wired uh veteran uh writers Stephen levy gave me some advice he's written lots and lots of books much more than i have he said there's an inverse inverse relationship to the length of the book and the sales the shorter the book the more it sells so i decided to make a, a t- i tend to make overwhelmingly big books and so this was a an attempt to make a smallest book i could possibly do it's 450 aphorisms and little proverbs. It's kind of the Bible without any stories. Most advice books tell stories, which is a really great way to tell it. But I decided to just give you the punchline. That's my style. Um, I'm more telegraphic. And so um, there are just little <clears throat> bits of wisdom, as I've been <clears throat> sort of indicating. But um Pros make as many mistakes as amateurs. They just learn how to gracefully recover from their mistakes. So don't worry about making mistakes that even professionals do, but they their different is that they're really good at recovering from mistakes. And that's the sign of professional. You all make mistakes, but you want to be able to recover from them very well. So you work on recovery. So anyway, I have a book like that. That's, that's sort of what it's about. But I, I think... Um, one of the reasons I have friends who work in academia and universities and and they can make a lot more money in um, the private world, but the reason they stay is because they get to work with young people. They have students, young students, and that for them is priceless. That is the payoff that keeps them young. And um, so that's one way to, to kind of do the intergenerational thing is, is, is to work with students um, as much as you can. Um, and uh, I think um, we have so many avenues for sharing right now that um, we're, you know, this is, this, this is, the world, it's never been a great, as good of a place right now to be able to share what you're doing. Um, so I, I think you should be, everybody should be sharing to the extent that they're comfortable with it. And maybe a little bit more. And um, you can tell, what's the word I want? Um, the feedback, you, you should be open to the feedback for it. And, and, and that is that is the real skill. The real skill is, is not in sharing, which we have technology to, but to learn from you what you share, to, 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 to read and to use 
that feedback is important because it again goes back to this paradox that you need the whole village to make you unique. You also have to follow and ignore the customer and ignore other people, but you also have to pay attention to them because they're going to, they have some data. So the bit of advice that I use in the book is like, when someone tells you that something does not work, they are right. When they tell you what the solution is, they're usually wrong. Okay. This is the whole thing that Pixar, this system was of like taking notes. So when people, so to you, when people are telling you things that aren't working, they're usually right. And you need to pay attention to that. When they tell you how to fix it, you can ignore it. They're usually wrong. And that's where your genius have to come in is actually coming in with that solution. But when you're sharing, you want to be open to the feedback and people are going to tell you where it doesn't work. And so you actually want to listen to that. That is actually incredibly valuable in terms of moving forward. But when they tell you how to fix it, you're that's ignore them. You need to retreat to your own genius to figure out that. We have about uh, 25 minutes left. Uh, I told you I'd give you the opportunity to ask us questions. We, mm -hmm. we do like to keep these sessions uh, back and forth open. Uh, do you have questions for us, Kevin? Yeah. Um, what do you want to know from people? Yeah. So, um, I'm always, uh, I have a couple of questions that are they're going to be maybe um, difficult, but um, to answer, um, I'm interested in uh, where where is a, what's a subculture right now where there's anywhere in the world that um, the people are not paying attention to and that maybe I should pay attention to? So I'm interested in sort of, that's one of the reasons why I like documentaries. I'm a big fan of documentaries because it can take me into an, uh, a little world that I knew nothing about and they can, can immerse me into that. And so I'm aware that there's just tons of little subcultures, little communities that are doing things uh, richly and deeply and I'm unaware. And so if someone can introduce me to one of those, I'll track it down. And it could be like a, a documentary that you saw um, that you'd recommend or um, that you're, you know, that you have some hobby in some, and there's a very devoted community to it. Maybe they're, you know, left-handed quilters. I don't know. It's, it's, um, I'm, I'm just um, always eager to, to, see another obsession in their world that might be interesting. And the VCs like Mark Andreessen, he was saying one of the, his rules of thumb for investing, and it was he would ask the founder, people coming, the founders, what their hobbies were, what they did for fun. And then he would invest into that. It was not what they were pitching. It was, how are you having fun? What are you what are you what are you really obsessed with when you're not obsessed with work? And so that's another way of framing it is like um is there any can, can you point me to a group that's obsessed with something that maybe I should know about? Yeah, what what is 40k lore, Tim? Oh no. <laughs> oh no. Um well so 40k are like tabletop miniatures. Oh, okay. Well 40k because it's set in the year like 40,000 40, years from now. Um 40,000 kind of, years from now. So so it's the future. Uh is that what it is? Yeah. Think high like high dark grim dark fantasy in the future. Okay. Does kind it have of to be dark. It's super dark, yeah. Lots of killing, lots of aliens, lots of okay. You know, it's kind of based like a lot of the lore is based on the Roman Empire. Ah, 
like and you throw in some like uh judas and jesus backstabbing okay. it cool so is this where the meme of um guys being more interested in in the roman empire than 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 sex is that is that where that's coming from i don't know how to answer this diplomatically I think it's related, probably. <laughs> but we're going to put it all... I mean, I don't know about sex, but we're going to put the Roman Empire in anything. That's what we're going to do. Right. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Uh, uh, the, the people on YouTube talking a lot about the law, especially because the law is kind of um, written by many authors and it's directed by a company. So then there's like debates on whether the law is actually evolving in a correct way. So it's like... An ongoing fiction that is being written and people have critiques and opinions about whether it's going in the right direction and um yeah it's really fun people so are it's, very it's, it's fanfic it's fanfic then they're, they're yeah. actually derived over some copyrighted material somewhere yeah there's this fanfic but a lot of fan analysis um okay. about how about how the the law is being written to this day yeah um and yeah. there's a, there's like fanfics written about it too yeah i see are you speaking out of your own experience or um, are you part of this group? Uh, I'm an enjoyer. I'm a, con I'm a connoisseur of this. I, I, I buy some books sometimes. Uh -huh. uh, and I used to play, I used to paint these miniatures when I was younger I see. And, and battle them. Okay. Uh, Very cool. It's called 40K Lore. It's a, yeah, it's a there's bit. Some there's some links in the chat people are posting too. Okay. Wow. Okay, great. I love that. That's fantastic. <laughs> I didn't Thank you. But yeah, thanks. Some some other answers. Uh, I put in like digital nomad scenes, especially in Bali and Chiang Mai seem underappreciated. Um, so tell me more about that. Who is that you or someone else? Yeah, that's me. Um, so what's so underappreciated about the, the digital nomad um, scene? So when I was spending time in places like Bali and Chiang Mai in 2017, like everything, the future, what we're experiencing now, things like remote work, uh, working independently, working on a variety of projects, actually liking your life, not suffering through work, it all seemed obvious and normal. Um, and that was sort of like a, a culture shock for me in a positive way. Uh, and these communities are still really interesting. And I was just recently in Bali and there's a whole market now of real estate things around people that have these more fragmented work lives, like co-living, co-work, pools, saunas, uh, hangouts with like daycare in them. And it's like, oh, there's a market for this sort of like seasonal worker. But in the US, like they're sort of missing this because we're still built around the factory schedule. Mm -hmm. Um mm -hmm. So that's the interesting thing for me. And I sort of just think work's going to continue to be um, moving in this direction, but slowly. And um, yeah, I'm headed to Chiang Mai in two weeks. Um, is most of the stuff in Bali happening around Ubud or is it throughout the island right now? Ubud, Changu, increasingly Uluwatu and mm. uh, areas north of Changu too. Like it keeps spreading north. Um but yeah, if you, if you go to these like uh, co-working places, they're like palaces now and they have like everything. They're all in one. It's it's pretty wild. And um, is it still, are, are there, are you finding people living there for longer periods of time? Is it is not as transient as it was or is it still just a month here, a month there and people are actually nomads i mean I, I i'm wondering if like is the no bad part important or is that kind of remote thing the more important part of this subculture so i think yeah i think the remote work is the most important part i think what's happened is it's gone from nomads like moving around a lot to slow mads and actually people <laughs> investing in new environments slow um mads. that's great and i'm like i know a lot of people with young kids now who are doing this and there's a uh, group called the traveling village uh -huh. and they're doing like 25 families with kids and uh it, it just still you know, they're, all, they're all moving together they, 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 they relocate as a tribe 
Yeah, for three months. Wow. Uh, for, for, for four months. I just put this in a chat. And okay. So, I mean, it just still seems to be growing. Whereas, like, pe- a lot of people are like, ah, digital nomad movement's over. But yeah, it's, it's pretty interesting. Oh, that's great. Um, so maybe another question is, um, um, I'm I'm really interested in um, um, how I'm I'm interested in heresies. I I I I like to collect heresies, and heresies I define as what it's something that you believe that the people that you most admire don't believe. Okay, so it's not just like you have. You think that you know something that that maybe the the mainstream doesn't believe. That's not a heresy. A heresy is is something that you believe that the people that you most admire think is crazy. And so I'm interested in anybody's heresy. Can does someone have a heresy that they're willing to share? I think you came to the right community. There might need to be a part two around heresies. <laughs> I'm not sure Again, how... it's, it, and then, and it was, so like here it would be like something that you believe that probably everybody here would not believe okay I'm not sure how heretical this is but I think um, I admire a lot of technologists and I'm kind of embedded within a lot of these communities mm-hmm. but I guess um what I disagree with a lot of technologists on is I think some like human limitations are actually good and necessary to preserve. Um, and I think, well, I guess maybe now that I'm saying, I'm like, I feel like we might all agree, but I feel like there's kind of this like utopian vision where it's like technology will free us from our limitations and we will be like these invincible cyborg mm-hmm. figures. Um, and I sometimes feel like, like we need to suffer and face challenges mm-hmm. otherwise. Um, yeah, I don't think we're going to be like full human beings in a way. Well, so. <laughs> what are what are some of the limitations that you think we should retain? Like mm-hmm. death? I think so. Death, okay. I um You're you're not for immortality. Okay. You think yeah. immortality would be a bad idea? What are your thoughts? I'm interested in you guys heresies. I I've, I've got my list, but <laughs> I want to hear your heresies. Yeah, I think immortality, um, maybe that doesn't make me very optimistic. I'm not sure if we would use it very well. Um, And I feel like there's something about being like we have a finite amount of time on this earth that makes us like have the sense of like Mm -hmm. urgency care. Um, Who knows? Okay. Anyone else have a heresy that they think that they believe that they think this group probably would reject i think i have one and i okay I, that people here might not fully agree because even i don't agree with myself on this <laughs> <laughs> I have two opinions on all important questions in life which i think is, is fair so my heresy is i think laziness is the best human quality and is kind of counter into counterintuitively it is what keeps the world relatively sane um uh-huh are incredibly lazy and that's great um i'm saying this on like my other half of my brain is like with a hammer like i don't want to say that like we would have a revolution everybody would get divorced all the time you know they would we would have no social stability whatsoever if people were not as insanely lazy as we are Uh are only hardworking because they revolt against their own laziness and the things in this life are built by people who cannot tolerate their own laziness it's not that they are not lazy um, and I just feel, maybe this is an Eastern European thing of me, um, but I feel this enormous gravitational pull into doing absolutely nothing um, and how much you can counter that and in what way and what social pull you will find for yourself it, for temporarily take off um, it will kind of determine your life. But we are insanely lazy and that's good. Okay, I'm sure. Yeah, does it, that would that does seem like pretty heretical. Um, Agree. Like, use your Zoom. Sorry about 
those who will watch this afterwards, but hands up with your um, little hand in, in a Zoom if you agree with this statement. Or if you have a part of you that agrees. Well, because most people don't. So that's good. That's a good heresy. <laughs> this is one we're trying to have. You want people not to agree with you. Yeah. Uh, um, so actually, I was just reading through this thing. So Hyder, um, you're saying that you actually, the Khomeini, Ayatollah Khomeini was uh, someone that influenced you. That And Ayn Rand, okay, that combination. Tell me about that. <laughs> Some power uh, combo but, over there. Yes, uh, they were actually uh, polar op uh, opposites because yeah. uh, Ayatollah Khomeini teaches like the self is bad, individualism is evil, um, like death to America, you know? Uh, but then, uh, and this, uh, I I was influenced by it while at university. Uh, and then my cousin who was living in Toronto at the time was reading Ayn Rand and he was influenced by Ayn Rand. So he introduced me to like the virtue of selfishness. I'm like, no, like Ayn Rand is the antichrist. Like she she's evil. Uh, but then uh, when I read into like um, her justification of uh, reason, um, the importance of capitalism, uh, like uh, what, what does the enlightenment mean, uh, classical liberalism, those uh, sorts of ideas, I realized uh, actually uh, like, um, I think at the foundation, like fundamentally, uh, human beings need to respect their agency. Like you need to respect your own uh, capacity to think for yourself uh, and then base all your beliefs on this. And there are actually elements within Islam that uh, support this, like, uh, and I believe like um, even in Christianity and Judaism, like there, there's this um, responsibility to uh, form your own convictions, uh, which is something I feel not many religious people actually value as much. Like, but I think this is uh, core to uh, like being human. Yeah, yeah, that's a great. So, so it's, one is total selfishness the other one is total selflessness and and yes. so those two yeah that's great well did anyone else have a i don't want to if did anyone else have a heresy maybe the last question for me um that, that they're willing to share with the group that would disagree with them could i share something please um i know i think i I know that there are already some agreeers in the room, but I wrote in the chat, not knowing, because you asked initially about people we admire. And I think many people I admire are uh, also in the public spotlight. And there's a thing where you always have to have something to say, or you have to know something. And I think, well, this this kills the question a bit, but I truly admire those <laughs> who, who, who say, ah, I don't know. And to leave space for for things to come in, and to say I don't know, frequently and aggressively. Yeah, I, I think that's true. I suspect most people probably agree with that, though, right? Who agrees? Who would agree? Raise your hand. <laughs> ah, okay, I'm not a heretic. I'm sorry. <laughs> you gotta work on that one. You gotta. <laughs> Well, anyway, so um, I don't think I have any more questions, but thank you for playing with me. I really enjoyed that. Um, and um, actually, I really enjoyed this whole session. So I'm, I'm, I'm really glad that you all showed up. Thank you for um, asking great questions because answers are cheap, questions are hard. So thank you. Amazing. You might have to host a session on uh, heresies yourself <laughs> in the future. That could be fun. Um, thank you so much for, to, uh, Kevin, really appreciate your time, uh, here. I think a lot of us were inspired by you, but so it's just, uh, very, uh, inspiring to spend a little time with you. I, again, I was, it was a pleasure. I'm going to plug my book one last time. I think people will enjoy it here. A great Christmas gift for someone who's young or young at heart. Thank you for your attention. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Kevin, and thank you all for coming. It's so yeah. great to see you. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.